will be co-hosting today's session with me. So just a couple of points of housekeeping. Everybody is on mute. Uh, we are happy to take questions. And if you could please use the Q&A function um, for any of your questions, we will do our absolute best to try and answer those questions whilst we're talking about the particular subject. Um, however, if we can't, we will ensure that we have time at the end to address those questions. And if there are too many questions for us to address within the hour, uh, we will um, send written responses to your questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will share a copy of the recording with you uh, after the seminar. So let's begin. And apologies, um, my camera will need to cut off but it's slowing my system down for some reason today so I'm going to start off um, with the agenda of today's webinar we're going to discuss the changes in respect of right to work changes there are a number of changes that came into play on the 6th of April and some changes further along the line there were also some increases in immigration related fees uh, which will bring to your attention and also the very new global business mobility routes which you may have come across which has redefined the intra-company transfer routes we're going to spend a little bit of time on that and then Stephen is going to talk you through sponsorship reform so is the sponsor management system finally going to get a rework and become a bit more user friendly um, so uh, and then we're going to also talk about the immigration impact of the Ukrainian conflict and the great job the Home Office has been doing with the Ukrainian humanitarian scheme visas and how that may uh, come into your view as an employer, as a sponsor, and how uh, you may address uh, applications from Ukrainian nationals subject to the humanitarian visa schemes. And also we'll touch on um, applications from Russia for Russian nationals uh, looking to be sponsored or, or come to the UK too. So uh, quite a lot to get through today, some really interesting stuff, uh, lots of change happening at the Home Office, we're all with a view to digitization, um, which should hopefully uh, make your lives as sponsors a little bit easier and quicker um, as, as the technology starts to bed in. So let's kick off with right to work changes. Now, as responsible employers, I don't need to tell you how important right to work checks are. You know, they need to be con uh, conducted prior to employment commencing or the morning of day one at the absolute latest. And the reason why it's so important to get this right from the beginning is because you as the employer will benefit from a statutory excuse should that individual subsequently become uh, an illegal worker without your knowledge and if you do this check late so on day two for example uh, you don't satisfy that statutory excuse and if that person inadvertently became illegal your business would be subject to a fine of up to twenty thousand uh, pounds per illegal worker so it's something very easy to get wrong but also something very easy to get right and if you're not incredibly strict on this point already uh, I urge you uh, to, to, to get stricter on, on this point. And with digitization, the process of right to work checks should be getting easier for you too. Um, and remember, if there's any knowing illegal employment, so where you know somebody doesn't have the permission to work and you continue that employment, there are criminal sanctions uh, which would lead the individual responsible for that illegal employment for imprisonment up to five years and an unlimited fine for the business and for those of you that have sponsor licenses having a bad track record of right to work checks with the home office and if you're subject to more than one right to work penalty it could call into question your ability to hold on to your sponsor license and that will then have a, an impact on your talent recruitment your talent retention where you're relying on overseas talent and you wouldn't be able to hold a sponsor license for at least a further 12 months if the, the license is revoked because of non-compliance with right to work checks. So 
please, uh, and if you have any questions or you need us to help you rework your processes, look at your documentation uh, from a right to work perspective, please reach out to your member of the Lewis Silkin immigration team. So prior to the 6th of April of 2022, there were two main ways of doing your right to work check. There was the traditional manual right to work check, which required you to meet the individual, verify their original documents, take a copy, sign date and certify, and track the expiration date. With the onset of COVID, the Home Office adapted those right to work checks. So we call them the sort of COVID adjusted right to work checks where you are allowed to undertake right to work checks through video calls. So you didn't need to meet the individuals in person. Um, the Home Office has you know, reworked that or renewed the validity of those adjusted checks from time to time. Um, but they're still in place. Essentially, you can still do video checks uh, provided the applicant has sent you copies of their documents. But the big changes which came into place on the 6th of April 2022 is online right to work checks. So online right to work checks, this is where your employee, so new employee or existing employee who you're doing a follow up right to work check for, where they hold a biometric residence card, a biometric residence permit, uh, or a frontier worker permit, will be required to issue you as a share code. So they'll log onto a Home Office portal, they'll put in their details, and that will give you a share code. You then log onto a Home Office database with that share code, and you will independently see a document with the applicant's picture, their name, their immigration permission, expiration date, and so on. And that will be your right to work check. So you'll download a PDF of that, um, and that will uh, satisfy your statutory excuse. And because this process has become digitized, there are going to be date stamps, there will be IP addresses logged. So it's even more important that these checks have been done prior to employment commencing or day, morning of day one at the very latest, because it's now easier for the Home Office to now track when those checks are being undertaken. Now. In reality, some people who are subject to the online right to work checks, there may be problems when you're logging onto the system uh, to undertake those right to work checks. Their share codes might not work, their records may be uh, incorrect on the Home Office's systems. And in those circumstances, we need to say, follow up separately with the Home Office to verify that and then potentially undertake a manual right to work check where required. Moving on into the future, and specifically for British and Irish nationals, there will be uh, a, a technology provider that's going to provide identity document validation technology, so IDVT provider. And this is where, where you're doing a right to work check for a British or Irish national. Uh, you will be able to use one of these IDVT providers for a fee, I'm afraid, and we don't know what those fees will be. Um, there have been some guesses that it will be a few pounds to tens of pounds per request, and that IDVT provider will be able to confirm the genuineness of that British or Irish passport. Now, because there is a cost associated with using one of these IDVT providers, you can still do a manual right to work check if you so wish. Now the requirements to become one of these IDVT providers is quite onerous. Um, so nobody's really come forward uh, to put themselves out and, and, and market their services just yet. So we're expecting that to, to come into play later on this year. And then that will mean British and Irish nationals right to work checks will be brought into line with overseas nationals who can have online right to work checks. Because right now, if you're British or Irish, you're slightly disadvantaged in that only your original documents can be reviewed from a right to work check perspective. Okay? And that's the whole purpose. And again, the Home Office is moving 
more to digitization because they believe it to be a safer uh, and more consistent way in satisfying that statutory excuse and reducing uh, illegal uh, immigration, illegal working within the UK economy. And again, because of digitization, we very much hope this makes your life as employers that much easier so you're not then chasing after original documentation uh, on day one and people forgetting to bring those documents in um, that it should hopefully uh, streamline the process. Okay. We're also going to have the end of the adjusted COVID right to work checks on the 30th of September. Um, so you will no longer be able to do a video call. So from the 30th of September this year, you'll only be able to do the online right to work checks, which is mandatory for those with a BRP, BRC or Frontier Work Permit from the 6th of April. And then for British and Irish passports, you would do the manual right to work check or uh, use one of the IDVT providers. Okay. Um, some questions have just come in, so if you give me a quick second to just see if there's anything I'm going to answer for you right now um, while we're in the context of this. So, so somebody has asked with regards to the list of eligible documents for right to work checks, obviously list B, groups one and two, uh, whether they are only subject to online right to work checks or not. So w when we're assessing whether somebody should be subject to online right to work checks only, it will be based on the documentation that they're providing you um, as evidence of that right to work. So if it's a biometric residence permit, biometric residence card, or a frontier worker permit, you can only undertake that right to work check online. Um, if they have a, uh, a valid endorsement in their passport, in a valid passport, so they don't have that biometric card um, or, or document that can be sort of read digitally, then a manual right to work check would still need to be followed in those instances. Okay, and there were no further questions on right to work checks, so moving on. So fees. So immigration, economic immigration work permits has taken a bit of a battering from a fee perspective over the years and the Home Office, the UK government have used cost of immigration as a way of reducing net migration to the UK. That hasn't really worked. The fees have gone up significantly over the years, but immigration to the UK uh, remains steady and high, and it looks like sponsors and employers have clearly adapted to the new cost of immigration to the UK. And as a reminder, if you're a medium or large size sponsor in the UK, to bring a skilled worker or intercompany transferee to the UK for up to five years cost circa nine and a half thousand pounds, give or take. So I was hoping to be able to say there's going to be some fee reductions. Unfortunately not, but uh, you know, in line with everything at the moment, costs are rising, but thankfully uh, not significantly. So we're having a very small increase in work categories of approximately 15 pounds. So for example, if you're applying for a visa from outside the UK for up to three years for one of your employees, it was £610. It's now going to be sort of £625, £630. So very small increments. And then there's an additional £30 on top of priority, optional priority services. Um, so they're not going to break the bank, but they have gone up slightly. So if you do have clawback clauses where you identify the costs you will be paying on behalf of a migrant worker, you may want to look at those and, and review your menu pricing if, if, if you've got those in your, in your documents uh, or contracts. And talking of clawbacks, it's becoming more and more common where a number of sponsors, where they're incurring these significant immigration costs, they are asking applicants to contribute some of the cost or where the employer responses covering all the costs, they are asking 
um, the individuals to sign up to a clawback clause. So if they leave the employment at, uh, we know within six, 12, 18 months, a percentage of that cost needs to be paid back. Some people like it, some people don't like it, some people think it sort of uh, doesn't attract the right talent if you're asking people to pay back, but um, you know, others feel it's a way of tying some employees into the employment a little bit longer if they then feel they have to pay back. Um, so there isn't a right or wrong answer as to how you go about that. But if you do have a clawback or a repayment clause, please ensure you are not clawing back or asking for any repayment of the immigration skills charge. That is a sponsor employer cost uh, and cannot be passed back to the individual. Okay, And the reason for that is if they do leave your employment early, the Home Office will refund you a proportion of the immigration skills charge that has been paid out. Okay. So moving on now to the new global business mobility route. So a lot of this stems from post-Brexit immigration and the Home Office and the Migration Advisory Committee having to look at our current routes of entry to the UK to see if they work uh, for sponsors, for businesses, and the way the UK wants to position itself in the global economy. So the Home Office itself said immigration routes that may have once worked for businesses no longer do so. They have not evolved in tandem with business. So on the 11th of April this year, we had the onset of the new global business mobility routes. Uh, which is their solution to modernize the UK immigration system to make it attractive to overseas businesses um, and supposedly easier routes to transfer overseas staff to the UK. Uh, it remains to be seen as, uh, as to whether they're actually that helpful or are they just rebranding and repackaged old routes um, to make them look more attractive, but in reality they are not. So there are five new routes essentially um, under the global business mobility route and then a, a couple of extra ones that we, we feel might, might be helpful, helpful to businesses. So the first one is uh, senior or specialist work because that replaces intra-company transfers. We then have the graduate trainee which is the old intra-company graduate trainee. UK expansion workers, which replaces what was the old sole representative of a business visa. Um, the only exception is on that, it doesn't apply if you're an overseas media representative and you can still use the old route. And secondment worker, and there's a high potential individual and a scale up visa as well that we're going to discuss. Now for many of you on the call today, um, the most important change will be the changes to the intra-company transfer route. So, so since 2008, when sponsorship first came into play, there's always been an intra-company transfer. It was known as tier two intra-company transfer, then it became just intra-company transfer or ICT. And now we're having another rebranding and it's being called, and it's a bit of a mouthful, global business mobility route, senior or specialist worker not to be confused with skilled workers. So uh, I'm sure that's going to be, um, you know, trimmed down to just SSW, and then the other visa category is called SW, skilled worker, so uh, not to be confused with each other. Now, in reality, this is just a rebranding of the old intra-company transfer route. There's nothing groundbreakingly changing with regard to this category. So the when the Home Office asked the Migration Advisory Committee to look at intra-company transfer and to redefine it for the for the new world, the new economy post-Brexit, uh, they did ask the Migration Advisory Committee, the Home Office, to consider whether we make the intra-company transfer route a non-temporary route and a route that led to settlement, so indefinitely to remain like it did when it was first uh, established. Uh, the Home Office didn't accept that request from the Migration Advisory Committee and 
the new senior or specialist worker route will not lead to permanent residence in the UK. It remains a temporary route for senior or specialist workers to work in the UK uh, for their UK group company where they've been employed by a linked overseas entity. The most significant change to this route is a slight increase in the minimum qualifying salary. So under the old intra-company transfer routes, that was £41,500. That's now been increased to £42,400. So if you are in the business of using uh, senior specialist worker intra-company transfer, uh, please ensure that you meet that new higher minimum for this tier. If you still go by the older route, the entry clearance application would be refused on the basis the individual does not score enough points for salary. The high earner threshold remains at £73,900. That has not increased. And the significance of the £73,900 means that the prospective assignee needs only to be employed by the linked overseas entity, even for a day, uh, as opposed to needing to be employed for a full 12 months prior to the transfer where they're paid 42400 or more. We can continue to use certain allowances as a way of supplementing and getting the assignee to the £42,400, such as accommodation allowance, cost of living allowances, uh, whether it's sort of a guaranteed payment to the assignee whilst they're working in the UK. We still have to work on an equation so the, you know, the, the majority of the package can't be accommodation. Um, so uh, only a percentage of it can be, and, and we need to work that equation when calculating that for you. Significantly, and remembering, there is a higher skill threshold of the role for senior and specialist workers. So that remains, as it did under the intra-company transfer route, at RQF level six, which is equivalent to a degree level role, but remember, Applicants do not need a degree to qualify for this role. It's just the skill level of the position that they'll be doing in the UK uh, needs to be that of a degree level role. And remembering skilled worker, so the new tier two general, has a much lower salary uh, skill threshold of level three, which is equivalent to an A-level standard role. Thankfully, there remains no English language requirement for this tier. So if you do need to transfer a colleague from your linked overseas businesses quickly and they're unable to uh, get a, a test for the skilled worker application or they don't feel they'll pass an English language test, this is still a very attractive category to bring them to the UK. And one other change, which I don't think is gonna be that problematic, is that senior or specialist workers will not be able to undertake supplementary employment uh, whilst they're working uh, in the UK. And when I'm talking about supplementary employment, uh, it's, you know, under the old rules, the intercompany transfer migrants were allowed to do 20 hours a week additional or supplementary employment at the same level in the same sector for which their sponsorship was assigned. So continuation to the sort of intra-company transfer and the new senior specialist worker. Under the old system, we had uh, intra-company transfer graduate trainee. We now just have a graduate trainee tier under the global business mobility route. Again, incredibly similar to the old route. The key difference being the slight increase in the minimum salary going up from 23,000 pounds to 23,100. Now, notably, this graduate training tier uh, is only used for your graduate employees in your overseas offices as part of a formal graduate rotation program. Uh, they need to have been employed by your linked overseas entity overseas for at least three months, and they can come to the UK for up to a year uh, to undertake uh, a part of that graduate program. Uh, which would lead them to a senior management or specialist role within the organization. Okay. We shouldn't be using this for a standard non-graduate training role just because the salary is far lower 
than the senior or specialist worker route. There is no English language requirement and again, no supplementary employment and time spent in this category does not lead to permanent residence. Um, just had one question through just to revert back to the senior or specialist worker. Um, what does high earner threshold mean? Can we clarify? So under the senior and specialist worker, the £73,900 is considered a high earner. Um, which means if you're paid £73,900 or more for your work in the UK, you do not have to have 12 months prior employment with your overseas linked entity and you're able to stay in the UK for up to nine years instead of five years where your salary would be below that. Okay, I hope that's answered the question. Um, please feel free to put any other questions if you, you have any questions on on that in the chat. Okay, so another change. Um, one I don't think is going to be that helpful to, to, to many of you on the call today. So I'm just going to run through this one pretty quickly. It's something called UK Expansion Worker. And this replaces a visa called the sole representative of an overseas business, which was essentially used for an overseas business looking to open a branch in the UK and it allowed them to send one of their senior overseas employees to the UK um, first to get the ball rolling in the UK, to register that branch, to start hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's now coming under the global business mobility route and it's called UK Expansion Worker. It does require sponsorship and this is one of the rare occasions where a company can become a sponsor without any employees in the UK. So they're going to give a very, uh, they'll issue a certificate, a sponsor management system access, very restricted to only be eligible for the expansion workers. Uh, the authorizing officer will be the first employee that's being transferred to the UK. It will be limited to having five overseas workers coming to the UK to help with the establishment of the UK branch and once it gets to a certain level, so it starts recruiting locally, it's had the PAYE registration, has a UK bank account, etc., they would then be expected to apply for a full-blown sponsor license under skilled worker and senior or specialist workers and sponsor under the normal way. There are some exceptions where um, the overseas entity is from Japan due to the UK-Japan trade agreement, uh, which means the, the Japanese employee wouldn't require 12 months with the overseas business. The minimum salaries and duration of prior employment is kind of aligned with the senior and specialist workers um, in terms of you know, minimum salary being 42,400. They have to be coming in a senior or specialist role, so the skill level is at level six. Uh, and there has to be a standard occupation classification code uh, allowing for that. The visa holders can come up to, to the UK for one year initially to set up that branch and extend for a further year so their leave is not extended beyond a total of two years. Um, significantly, the time spent under this category will not count towards permanent residence. So if they do want to stay in the UK long term, they do need to move that permission to skilled worker as soon as they can. So um, a quick question on the expansion worker. Yes, the entity must be incorporated in the UK prior to the application. There has to be business plans, some market research to show the genuineness of the overseas business wanting to open in the UK. And this is a, it's a new category, it's a new tier, but it's a rehash and a reworking of the representative of an overseas business visa. So it's not entirely new. Um, we had a similar category before the um, uh, last month. Okay, we have a further new category under the Global Business Mobility Route and it's called Service Supplier. Now this category replaces um, a very, how can I put it politely, <laughs> difficult immigration category called International Agreement. Um, 
And we were really hoping the Home Office would have significantly reworked this to the benefit of UK businesses. Now, service suppliers is for UK businesses that have a contract for the delivery of services with a contractual service supplier or an independent professional who needs to come to the UK to provide those services. And those services need to be covered by international trade treaties. So for example, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, World Trade Organization treaties such as the General Agreement on Trade and Services or individual country treaties that the UK may have. The threshold for qualifying for this type of visa is incredibly high. It does require you as the UK business to have a sponsor license and to have applied for the service supplier tier to be activated. You do need to ensure before you're able to sponsor under this category you have sent the Home Office a copy of the contract you have with the overseas business to confirm that it is covered under a treaty that the UK is party to and sectoral commitments, so not just uh, the trade treaty, there might be some sectors that are excluded, uh, that the contract was open, awarded through an open and secure bona fide bidding process and that the individuals that are coming to the UK have the necessary skills, experience, prior employment will be remunerated to at least national minimum wage before having to sponsor them. Now for certain sectors, if you're looking at mainly engineering, in my experience, have had to fall back on this, this international agreement tier quite significantly. Um, and I can only think of businesses needing to use this more as you enter into agreements, you know, particularly with EU businesses that have no legal presence or no commercial presence in the UK. You may be forced um, to go down this route if you want to be able to purchase those services from those companies. Um, because it's so specific, I'm more than happy for anybody on the call today to reach out to, to me if they would like to discuss how it may impact or help their business uh, in further detail. Okay, another new category is called secondment worker. This is, um, again, a pretty high threshold for it to be useful. So this is where the, if you're a UK company and you're benefiting from overseas investment of uh, at least £10 million a year or £50 million in total, you'll be able to um, bring people under the secondment worker category. So uh, again, the company that you're contracting with uh, to bring their staff to the UK to be able to provide their services under contract uh, for this high value contract. Okay, they must be paid at least national minimum wage, um, similar to the international, the service supplier tier. They have to be doing a skilled job in the UK and significantly it has to be an RQF level six job. So, you know, lower skilled roles, more manual roles um, will not qualify for this secondment worker. So, um, you know, if there's, you know, in, in engineering or construction, um, those kinds of roles may not qualify if it's more hands-on manual specialist labor. The secondment must have been employed by that overseas business for at least 12 months and they can get a visa for one year and they can extend that to two years. Um, it's similar to some of the visa rules, but you'd always look at the visitor rules first and foremost to see if there's any exceptions or permitted activities uh, before you would need to engage in becoming a sponsor uh, for, for, for the overseas company because that does have a number of sponsor compliance obligations for you. Okay, we've got high potential individual. Now this is essentially um, a graduate visa for non-UK graduates. So I think this is uh, quite a good scheme and we might see quite a lot of these come into the UK. So if you find somebody who's overseas and they are a graduate of the top 50 global universities, um, they can they consider a high potential individual and, and they may secure a visa 
uh, that would allow them to come to the UK without a job offer, so they can come and do the job hunting here if necessary, or you know you can try them out without committing to sponsorship if you found them from overseas and want to support them with this application, uh, as long as the qualification was awarded in the last five years. So the uh, the university has to have uh, been on uh, the Times Higher Education World University ranking, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong: the Quack Quarelli Simmons World University rankings, or the academic ranking of world universities. It needs to be on at least two of those rankings to qualify as a high potential uh, degree. So uh, I think that could be really helpful. We're seeing a lot of people, so foreign UK graduates, moving into the graduate scheme inside the UK. And I think, again, this is a great way of attracting the brightest and the best graduates uh, to the UK. So again, it's something to look at as part of your talent strategy when identifying candidates from overseas to see if this can be utilized in the first instance uh, before committing to sponsorship. And then because the UK is still such an attractive hub to startups and scaling up businesses, uh, we, we're going to have something called a scale-up worker visa from August 2022. Uh, information is quite light uh, at the moment, uh, but this is essentially for businesses that are in scale-up mode uh, and they can bring um, people with the skills and specializations to continue to grow their businesses in the UK with a number of concessions um, on salary, skill level, um, and, and so on. So they still have to meet an English language requirement like they would for skilled worker. They have to meet a maintenance requirement, and they'll get immigration permission granted for two years. But the key difference here is once they're finished working with that scale-up business that's brought them to the UK, they can continue to work without requiring further sponsorship in the UK, uh, provided they can show that they have PAYE earnings equivalent to £33,000. Now, once we get the full guidance on this um, and we become a bit more familiar with it, we will issue guidance and alerts as to how it may help some of you as startup businesses um, with your talent strategy. So just mindful of time, I'm going to pass you now to Stephen, who will go through some of the sponsorship reforms with you, and then uh, we'll close with some questions. Thanks, Stephen. Oh, hello, Stephen. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Ah, good. Okay, good. So as you said, I'm actually just joining. I'm not quite joining from the Belfast office, but close enough today. Um, so apologies if my dog starts barking in the background. Um, so sponsorship reform. So I'm going to just move the slide on. So in August last year, the Home Office published its sponsorship roadmap document, setting out the key reforms it intends to introduce to improve the sponsorship system. Um, Anybody who uses the SMS on a, on a regular basis understands how kind of um, clunky and non-user friendly it is, so it's long overdue an overhaul. But the purpose of the reforms is to build on the government's commitment to attract the best and brightest talent from around the world with a fully digital immigration system. So we've seen Supi obviously talking us through the move to um, digital right to work checks. We've seen the start of the rollout of digital visas, replacing the BRP cards. Um, but the Home Office is hoping to make it the in-to-in -in process much smoother and quicker by having a fully digital immigration system. The reforms aim to make it easier for users to understand and navigate the sponsorship process. The reforms to date include um, making the sponsor license application process fully paperless and providing simpler guidance for sponsor license applications. Suspending the cap on sponsored workers, which used to exist under Tier 2 General. Um, so now there's no limit on the number of skilled workers that can come to the UK, provided that they, are, that they are eligible for the roles. And the introduction of a priority fee of £500 to expedite requests. 
The focus for 2022 is uh, to improve service standards, to review and improve the service standards, um, to offer a shorter service for, for straightforward applications. The reform of sponsor license renewal patterns, um, uh, possibly removing the renewal requirement. So at the moment you have to renew your license every four years. And this is just part of the plan to replace the sponsor management system. And the aim is to have all licensed sponsors on a new system by Q1 2024. As part of the uh, overall, they're introducing a new set of packages. And one of the first packages to be introduced mid-year this year will be the sponsor of visa service, which is uh, it's a streamlined process whereby the employer um, or the representatives can share a pre-populated visa application form to the candidate with things like the role information, et cetera, already included um, and brought across from, from the sponsor. Uh, manage a license service, which is for sponsors to carry out post-license activities, including sponsor changes, um, having a sponsored migrants dashboard and status and then prompts to to um, to help applicants make the right reports at the right time. Basically, it's to improve the SMS to make it more user friendly, and a long overdue view sponsored workers and their status, making it easier to track and report updates. Uh, the amount of times that we get requests from clients to say, "Can you just run off a quick?" Um, report showing all the applicants that are sponsored from our license. Now we have, we we keep those records for ourselves, but it's not something you can just go onto the sponsor management system and go, here's a list of everybody sponsored under the license. Here's a list of all the linked entities, which is something that has been added um, under the new um, GVM routes. The, you can actually log into your sponsor license now and there's a, there's a separate tab on the left hand side for adding linked entities. Um, the become a sponsor service for new sponsors uh, from 2023. Again, this is part of making it easier to apply for your license, but what they're hoping to do is use, use data that's available to do inbuilt data validation checks on things like who your authorizing officer is, making sure that they're an employee of the company or an officer of the company, um, getting information about your organization from other sources, um, to reduce the opportunity for abuse and simplify evidence requirements, thereby uh, reducing the overall processing time for applications. So things like being able to check if uh, check with HMRC if your level one user is an employee, being able to check on company's house for your, the latest financial statements, things like that, uh, just to make your sponsor license application a bit smoother. So. Um, one thing that is not going to change about through all of this is compliance. Um, part of the reason for increasing this, um, increasing the service is to be able to monitor the, the, the reporting duties, etc. Um, and compliance remains central to the sponsorship system. Uh, the new system aims to make greater use of technology to be able to identify abuse through the SMS. Um, as Supi mentioned, being able to track IP addresses to make sure people are logging in uh, using their correct level one logins, et cetera. Um, and then the compliance visits will be kind of targeted to sponsors who present a higher risk or have no track record of compliance. And just finally on that, on that note of compliance, some of you may recently have received a call or an email from the Sponsor Assurance and Investigations team at UKVI or one of their outsourced partners uh, in relation to your license. Uh, I've certainly received four or five emails recently and calls uh, because I would be level one or key contact on a number of, or representative on a number of licenses. But UKBI have decided to, to review sponsor licenses and they're contacting authorizing officers, key contacts and level one users to ensure that the records are all up to date. They're providing guidance if the license is not being accessed regularly by level one users or if the users and key personnel are not up to date. So their records aren't perfect because I know I had a call during the week. Uh, sorry, I had an email during the week saying we had tried to get in touch with you, but they hadn't. And also say you haven't accessed the license in over a year, um, but I was able to show them that I had requested a restricted certificate um, or a defined certificate within the last month. So, but mainly that it's not kind of accusatory, it's more that they want to check that you're using the license, that the people on your license are still required. So it's a good time 
to do a uh, sponsor license health check, you know, just log in, check the details, make sure your addresses are up to date, make sure the email addresses of um, the contacts on the license are up to date, um, make sure your authorising officer is still employed there or director of the company, um, and just generally make sure that people can, um, can be contacted, uh, that the correct contact details are available. If you're concerned about wider compliance based on anything we talked about today or if you think it would be a good idea to kind of do a, a health check on your license in a more formal way, we also have a mock audit, which we do for clients, um, which simulates uh, a home office audit. Um, and we also have an updated client guide, including the new right to work changes. So if you're interested in uh, one of those, then, then do get in touch with us. So the next thing I just wanted to talk about is the impact of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine on UK immigra immigration. Um, the UK's response to the, to the conflict is still evolving. Um, initially, from a visa perspective, the response was limited to some concessions around work and study routes, but the, even this was limited to kind of additional flexibility around documents that, that you would need to provide or uh, locations where applications can be submitted. So the UK government has now introduced three immigration schemes, the Ukraine Family Scheme, the Homes for Ukraine Sponsorship Scheme, and the Ukraine Extension Scheme, which is due to be launched in May. While these schemes may not have a lot of relevance to your day-to-day -day business, it, it might be just important to know that they exist and in case you have any employees or their family members that have been affected, in which case you can at least direct them to the correct resource, uh, including an information page we have on our website. But in addition, in future, you may need to conduct a right-to-work check uh, for a potential employee or candidate who holds one of these uh, permissions. So the um, let me just say the Ukraine family scheme is open to immediate and extended family members of British nationals, UK settled persons, and certain other nationalities, or sorry, certain other categories. Eligible applicants are able to live, work, and study in the UK, as well as access public funds for up to three years. It's free to apply, and the immigration health sur surcharge isn't payable. The Homes for Ukraine scheme provides an alternative option for Ukrainians with no family ties to the UK. The scheme enables individuals, charities, community groups and businesses to act as sponsors by volunteering accommodation. People arriving under this scheme will be able to live and work in the UK for up to three years. And the final scheme is the Ukraine Extension Scheme, which allows the Ukraine national who is in the UK and had permission to be in the UK on the 18th of March 2022 it allows them to stay in the UK and their partners and children can also stay in the UK under this scheme. This visa would be granted for up to 36 months or up to a total period of 36 months under the Ukraine scheme if they're already here under another element of the scheme. The applicants could work, study and access public funds. There are also general asylum and humanitarian protection options, uh, but the government appears to be seeking to avoid these with the introduction of the above schemes. Um, one point in relation to right to work uh, is uh, is that some some of the initial arrivers under these schemes, the Home Office didn't physically have uh, stamps for Border Force to use on arrival, and so some of the stamps were just stamped in with dates and handwritten across. So you may see uh, you may see some um, right to work. Uh, right to work issues there, but we're waiting on guidance from the Home Office as to how to um, how to check these documents. So um, the current immigration implications for Russian citizens, because it obviously um, has an impact worldwide. The in-country applications are currently being processed, but may be subject to enhanced security checks. So if you have a Russian national who's currently employed by you, or you're seeking to imply by way of change of employment application, these applications are still currently being processed, um, but they may be uh, subject to enhanced security checks and some delays in processing. In addition, the Home Office may not exercise discretion to switch Russian citizens from visitor status to other routes, outside the rules, I mean, they may not exercise that discretion for, for any nationality, but it's something that 
we have successfully done a number of times in the past where somebody where the, you know somebody cannot travel overseas to simply apply to return to the UK if they've come in for an interview and they're here as a visitor, um, but the rules require them to return home to, to apply. Um, sometimes the home office is willing to exercise discretion. It's unlikely in this case that they would. Um, entry clearance applications can still be made by Russian citizens. However, they may be subject to enhanced security checks. And some applicants have been advised that the visa applications enter that their application is complex, so they cannot be dealt with within the normal service standards and, and um, have kind of been on hold. In a more practical term, some services such as the English language testing and TB testing may be suspended in Russia. From our own practical kind of uh, knowledge, the English language testing, uh, it seems to be just impossible to get an appointment for IELTS in uh, in, in Russia at the moment. TB testing is still going ahead, but you, there's wait times of kind of four or five weeks to get an appointment. And there seems to be similar wait times to get a, a visa appointment or a biometrics appointment at the visa application centers. Uh, some individuals who have left Russia and are in another country as a visitor, they may not be able to submit their UK entry clearance from another country, depending on the category that they are applying for. Now this is, so if you're applying for a skilled worker or most business routes, you need to be a national of the country where you apply or have legal status there beyond the visitor. So if you have a work permit for another country, you can apply there. Um, but it, you know, for Ukraine nationals, if you're in another country and you're allowed to apply as a, uh, you, you're allowed to apply as a visitor because there's a concession available, this concession may not be extended to Russian nationals. Um, categories such as creative worker, etc you don't need to meet that that, that basic requirement. Um, in general, entry clearance processing has slowed due to priority services being withdrawn for non-visit categories, and this affects all nationalities, and it's something you need to build into your recruitment generally um, just to, to manage expectations that these applications in general are taking kind of three to four weeks from the date of the appointment. And so the um, the proposed visa penalties, this is in relation to the Nationality and Borders Bill that is currently in the final stages of progressing through the UK Parliament. It contains provisions to impose visa penalties on countries the Home Secretary considers to have taken actions that pose or is likely to pose a threat to international peace and security, results are as likely to result in armed conflict, or gives or is likely to give rise to a breach of international humanitarian law. Uh, once the Act is in force, if approved, uh, the immigration rules could be amended so that interference applications from citizens of the subject country um, or countries could be stopped from being granted, be held to be invalid, and or require an additional fee to be paid. The penalties will not affect applications submitted before the rules are changed. The government has said that it could apply these powers if approved to Russia. Um, it seems to be very flexible because there will be scope for different penalty provisions for different purposes and also uh, capacity for exemptions and exceptions. So as an employer, what does this, uh, what does this mean for you? What should you be doing? Uh, you need to ensure that your policies for dealing with immigration applications for those affected by the conflict are coordinated across the business and that legal and policy developments are monitored. Um, if you are on our mailing list, then we, we generally provide uh, in briefs or updates um, on, on any changes that are relevant to employers. Um, ahead of guidance for employers becoming available on the Ukraine sponsorship scheme, uh, which we're hoping that the UKVI will produce the, we consider um, consider internal communications to your employees, just confirming the existence of the Ukraine schemes, raising awareness of the immigration concessions around applying for UK visas for Ukraine nationals, and then potentially just signposting to organisations, matching sponsors to refugees, um, if there have been any requests for assistance in coordinating this matching. Um, and again, it's if you need any kind of wording or if you need to signpost to anywhere, then we're obviously happy to happy to help with that. And that is it. So I'm just going to check and see if there is anything on the um in the in the Q and A that need to be answered. 
so one of the questions is, can you say more about the immigration skills charge? How much is it and when does it apply? The, the immigration skills charge is pay, it's paid at the same time as the certificate of sponsorship is assigned. It's £1,000 per year for each year of the visa, or it's £364 per year for small or charitable sponsors. So, for example, a three-year visa would be, for a medium or large business, you would pay £3,199 at the point that you assign the certificate of sponsorship, £199 for the certificate of sponsorship, and £3,000 for the immigration skills charge. So to confirm, the online checks are now all that is required for non-British Irish assets, or do you also need to see the original documents? So uh, I can take that one, Stephen. Um, yeah. So online right-to-work checks required from the 6th of April 2022, where the prospective employee or existing employee is presenting you with a biometric residence permit, biometric residence card or frontier work permit, you must undertake the online right to work check following them giving you a share code and then you logging onto the home office database um, to verify via that. If for whatever reason the share codes don't work, um, we'll need to contact the employer checking service or the home office uh, for further guidance or you know undertaking a manual right to work check. And the same um, you know as employers have for right to work checks, landlords have similar requirements for right to rent checks. So if your employees ever come to you with any difficulties on being able to prove their right to rent, um, again, feel free to reach out to your immigration uh, contact at Lewis Hilkin and we'll be happy to, to help navigate the right to rent rules as well. Um, and then how do we engage with the Ukraine family scheme? Do you need to be a current employer with a license or can it be done without? So the... <clears throat> The uh, Ukraine Family Scheme it, you know, doesn't require you to be a sponsor because you're not issuing certificates of sponsorship in the same way you would for you know, a skilled worker or a senior specialist worker. Um, so it's where they have um, the permission under the scheme you'd be undertaking the right to work check in the appropriate way to confirm their ability to work for you. Um, I know there are lobbies and, and requests that employers can specifically sponsor people from Ukraine to start working. Um, to support the humanitarian efforts. Uh, however, you can also use your sponsor license if you have one um, uh, to sponsor Ukrainian nationals under skilled worker or senior specialist worker where they qualify, which may be quicker and a more prudent route of entry for that Ukrainian national to come to the UK um, with some of their dependents. But there are some restrictions and the skilled worker or the senior specialist worker won't have some of the generosity uh, in terms of cost or um, uh, extension to family members uh, as the humanitarian visa schemes would. Uh, one more question in terms of the, on the right to work check. So EU national, so if they have status under the EU settlement scheme, even prior to the 6th of April, uh, employers were required to do the online right to work check for them. So they would still need to issue you the uh, share code because they were issued with digital uh, permission. So that would continue uh, unchanged. And we are seeing more and more uh, people issued with digital visas now. Um, so online right to work checks is uh, only going to increase and become more and more important and needs to be factored into your uh, processes and procedures for right to work checks. Um, we have. Uh, See when you spotted any other questions. Uh, just uh, if we have migrants re-entering under the CAS concession scheme on short-term temp routes, is a new right to work check required upon each entry if, if within a short space of time? Technically, yes. I think the so if you're talking about the creative um, worker CAS concession, where you obviously where you don't need an applic an appointment or you don't need a visa endorsed before you arrive, you just bring your certificate of sponsorship if it's, if it's for less than three months. Technically, yes, you would have to do a new um, a new right to work each time because it's a new series of employment or, in, or engagement. Um, 
but yeah, it's so it's it, you know it's it's you would you would require because you're covering different periods of of engagement and you don't know if their status has changed in between um, in in between series of engagement. So if you have a cause covering three months, then once will be fine. If they're going if they're coming in and out, but if they leave say for a month and then restart again, then the new rights work should happen at that time. Great. Um, one last question has come in. Do you anticipate that after the 30th of September that all right to work checks will go online? Should a business start preparing for this now or wait for more information from the government? So um, not all checks will go, will go online from the 30th of September. So we're lo losing the COVID concessions uh, in terms of video checks. So the majority of people will have e-visas, BRPs, BRCs, frontier work permits. So they will be already online but remember for British and Irish nationals you are not forced to use the IDVT app uh, providers or, and pay their uh, their fees so if you choose not to use those providers you would have to do a manual right to work check for British and Irish nationals and there may be some older visa categories uh, where people still have vignettes in their passport that may require you to undertake a manual right to check check so we would anticipate for the bulk of your employees, um, subject to immigration permission, your checks will all be online and you should adapt your processes and procedures and uh, onboarding documentation to factor that in. But there will be some that will still need to be checked manually. Um, and that's all the questions. So just want, I know we're a couple of minutes over, but to take this opportunity to say thank you for joining us on today's session. We will share a recording of, of the slide deck and just to second what Stephen said, from a compliance perspective, uh, if you do receive an email or one of these calls uh, from the Home Office saying that you haven't logged in, uh, don't be worried. Again, feel free to reach out to us if you want us to help you uh, respond to that email or call. But it does uh, bring about an important reminder that as sponsors, you should be logging into your sponsor licenses regularly. You should be checking your key personnel are accurate and correct. So for example, if authorizing officers or key contacts have left your business and haven't been replaced, um, you should be looking to action that sooner rather than later. And again, where we manage your sponsor license for you, feel free to reach out for us if you want us to remind you as to who is listed on your license. And if you want more information on our Right to Work handbook, again, reach out to us. Thank you again. We hope you found today's session useful and uh, we look forward preparing to preparing our next webinar for you. Thank you and goodbye.